Okay, thank you very much. Yes, this is the topic, and I should say that uh, I'm at the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics and the Research School of Earth Sciences, so what I spend my time doing is trying to convince astronomers who are focused on looking at the sky that the Earth, in fact, is a planet, and talking to the Earth scientists who focus on the Earth all the time and trying to convince them that the Earth, in fact, is a planet. It's an interesting debate because people are up there or down here, and really the Earth is uh, a planet. All right, so this is a wonderful book, and I'm surprised that Eric Smith's talk. He didn't mention his book. His new book just came out. I, it's a wonderful thing. It's about the topic of this uh, conference, so don't walk, run to go buy a copy. And uh, there it is, and here's Eric, and uh, here's Harold, and this is their book. And the topic that, of my talk is to change the, the topic of this book, change the title of this book from The Origin and Nature of Life on Earths and the Emergence of Fourth Geospheres. So that's essentially the, the, a four-letter change or something to the book title. So I'm just trying to generalize the study of the origin of life to the origin of life elsewhere. So now this is a Francois. And he says, it's easier to know man in general than a man in particular. So that's kind of a theme that I'll be talking about. I should talk into this microphone. <laughs> um, it's easier to know man in general than a man in particular. So uh, yesterday, Eric Smith talked about this particular paper. I hadn't read it, so I looked it up. And attempts to define life do not help to understand the origin of life. I, I thought that was very interesting. And uh, in, in this paper, you can see this. What is important in the origin of life field is understanding the transitions that led from chemistry to biology. So I said, oh, that's a nice thing. I agree very much with that. But then I said, oh, I can improve on that by changing the sentence from that to this, change led to lead. And it's a very simple change, and it just makes it a more generic thing. And another way to do that is to change what happened on Earth to what happens. It's just a very subtle semantic shift that uh, is essentially what I'll be talking about today. So this guy is Giordano Bruno. He said, this space we declared to be infinite. In it are an infinity of worlds of the same kind as our own. I'm not sure what data he used to, to conclude that, but he got burned at the stake for saying something similar. Now, today we have this. This is a Hubble Deep Field, and this is a tiny, tiny fraction of the sky. If you hold your pinky up to the sky and look through that fingernail, that's about the size of the, the sky you're looking at. And these are thousands of galaxies. And uh, just for some numbers, there are about 10 to the 11 stars in our galaxy and 10 to the 11 galaxies in the observable universe. So that means there are about 10 to the 22 stars in the observable universe. And there are about 10 to the 21 Earths in the observable universe. When I say Earths, I mean wet, rocky planets in the habitable zone. But that's something that we should, we'll talk about. Uh, and you should know that cosmological observations are consistent with the universe being geometrically flat and therefore spatially infinite, so an infinite number of Earths. So you've got a lot of Earths out here in the universe. Lots and lots of them, as many as you want. Now, I'm a, I was, uh, I'm a cosmologist, so here we have what the universe is made of, vacuum energy, cold dark matter, and about 4.5% normal matter. And here's what the sun is made of, hydrogen, helium, and about 1.5% other elements. And here's what life is made of. Now, that's an interesting understand. Now, this is an important number, 1.5, because I'm going to compare the sun to other stars. Now, if you're a chemist, this is your periodic table. And if you're an astronomer, this is your periodic table. It's much simpler and easier to remember. <laughs> Hydrogen, helium, and metals. And if you want to know a little bit more about astronomy, metals means Fe on H, because we use iron abundance to represent all of these things all of these things. So that means neon and nitrogen are metals, for example, to an astronomer. Now, why is that important? Well, that, we use this Fe on H. I'll show you in the next plot. This is a, a paper I published in 2001. On the, here is the Big Bang, and here's today. Notice this was published in 2001, so it's like 15 years ago. And the universe has gotten 400 million years older in about 15 years. But so this is time here. Here's the star formation rate of the universe. Here's today. In the past, it was higher, 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 and then there was no star formation. Now, what that means is that if you start here at the Big Bang, the metallicity of the universe, the non-hydrogen helium, builds up, builds up very quickly because of the high star formation rate. And then as the star formation rate goes down, the increase in the metals slows down. But it's a monotonically increasing function, so you're getting more and more garbage in the universe. 
Why is that important? Because the Earth is made out of garbage. It's made out of metals. Here is the approximate distribution of the metals that you need to form an Earth. This Earth that we're standing on is made out of Si and O and a whole bunch of non-hydrogen and helium. And this is the regime there you, where you need in order to form an Earth. Notice that in the first oh, a billion or two years, these stars, these stars that are forming do not have high metallicity and therefore could not have formed rocky planets. You could not have life because you don't have any O to make the water or carbon monoxide. Now what that means is if you take the distribution of stars, cut off the first two billion years or so, you're left with this distribution with big error bars, and that uh, was published as the Earth formation rate or the age distribution of Earths in the universe. Why that's interesting is because here's where the Sun and Earth formed, and here is approximately where we think life started. We're not quite sure whether it was here or here, but uh, that's interesting. So if life is common in the universe, as suggested by the rapid appearance of life on Earth, I should say the rapid appearance of life on Earth is a very, very important number because from it you can conclude quite a few things. For example, uh, how often we should expect life elsewhere. Kind of a weird uh, inverse probability calculation that you can look up in a paper that I wrote about 10 years ago. Anyway, we have Nutman et al. Recent paper came with the Vicki Bennett contributing to that at the ANU, and we have these stromatolites, the oldest macroscopic evidence for life, reported uh, just a few months ago, 3.75, and then Bell et al. based on carbon-1213, like carbon inf uh, evidence for isotopic controversial evidence for early life at 4.1. The whole point is that these dates have been getting earlier and earlier, and so this green arrow is getting closer and closer. And the closer it gets to the formation of the Earth, the easier it is to conclude that the probability of life elsewhere is higher. In any case, uh, it gives you, an, this age distribution gives us an idea about how we compare to other life that may exist in the universe. Now, half a bit, this is a two mass image. Here's the Milky Way. Here's the large and small Magellanic clouds. Uh, and it's a half a billion stars of the about 300 billion stars in our galaxy. And the question is, what fraction of those have planets? Well, this is a historical subject which has been going on for about uh, 20 years now. So in 1995, notice on the y-axis here is the lower limit on the percentage of stars with planets. So in 1995, we found one, and it would be consistent with, hey, 0% have planets. But then we said, oh, at least five, oh, at least 10. And then our great paper in 2003 said, oh, at least 25%. And then this number has been going out, oh, at least 50, at least 60, at least. And now here we are in 2017 over here. And so this number is uh, essentially 100%. And so the default, the new default that has changed in 20 years is, you look up at, a, at the sky and see a star, and the default is that it has some type of planetary system around it. And here's some of the details of how that was made. Now, here's a nice plot. Here's the orbital period of a planet. Here's the mass of the planet. And it, there's a whole bunch of techniques that have been used to discover. There's radial velocity or Doppler technique, transit technique from the ground, transit from Kepler. Uh, in our solar system, here's our solar system right here. Jupiter, here's Earth. This thing is like Earth-like, here's like Jupiter-like. Then there's debris disks, there's direct imaging over here, and there's pulsar timing here and here and here. So there's many wonderful techniques of, to detect these exoplanets, and you can see that most of them are over here and very few are over here. Well, that's a selection effect. Do not go home thinking that there are no planets here because we know that the selection effects for these things are very steeply declining as you go towards the lower right here. Now, that's 2012. Oops, that's 2012, here's 2015. So as uh, Kepler made more and more detections, this thing changed, this, this uh, red cloud moved to the right as in this arrow. And uh, you can see now there are more, there are kind of a few a handful of Earth-like planets, both in, both in terms of its period and the mass, and a couple of Jupiter-like ones as well, but you can see that we're still the Earth and Jupiter are still on the edge of this diagram, so the Earth-like planets and Jupiter-like planets are very still very hard to detect, and keep that in the back of your mind. Now, one way to show that is a nice paper by Pettigrew in 2014, in which, again, orbital period, but here not mass, but planetary size, and here is the completeness of this Kepler survey. And you can see here's zero. You can't see it much here at all. And then you can see, oh, these are all complete. And so you go from complete to very, 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 very little. 
uh, very completeness. And so here is where the Earth is. So you can see at this early stage, before the final Kepler data was out, that the Earth was not even, we couldn't see it very well. And so it's in the 100% the incomplete area. So that's the kind of selection effect that we're dealing with. Now, unfortunately, the new test, the, the new test uh, observatory will not do very well in here either because it takes such short, it, it takes an image here, an image here, an image here. It, it doesn't look long enough to probe this long region of orbital period. Okay. So the new default is this artist's period. Every star you look at has some type of planetary system around it. So in the last few decades, we've discovered the extraterrestrial environments known to exist has gone just enormous, probably much, much bigger than this. So lots and lots of extraterrestrial environments have been found. And extraterrestrial environments known to harbor life has also increased. So the hope is that these two will overlap as they get bigger and continue to get bigger. Now, one thing about this diagram is, for each one of these planets, we know what the star luminosity is. And we know how far the planet is from the host star, so we can turn it into an effective temperature on these planets. So using the information of the period of, and the luminosity of the star, it turns into this. So we've changed this to planetary to effective temperature, and here is mass. And so here is where you might call the habitable zone. And I agree with Mark Jelinek that the atmosphere is very important for determining where this is. If you can add gas, then, it, then the habitable zone can get further out. You decrease it, it gets further in. And uh, later on in this talk, I'll talk about not only is atmosphere important, but biology itself may be even more important. In any case, here's the, where we might have habitable moons. Here are brown dwarfs up here, and here's the Earth. And you can see that we haven't found many here, but this was 2012. If you do 2015 data, there'll be a few points around here. Okay, but one of the things that TESS will be able to do is this plot here. Here's planetary mass, here's planetary radius. And here's, if, if, if the, this is like a radius density plot, right? And so we have, if the planet is pure hydrogen, this is where it would be. If it were pure water, here's where it would be. Pure rock here and pure iron here. You can see that Earth and Venus are here. They're a mixture of iron and rock and water right here. You can see that these guys are just hydrogen, consistent with being hydrogen. And then as you go down here, it gets smaller and smaller planet mass or smaller radius. It it asymptotes to this region here. Now, this is a little bit of an old plot. Three years ago, we have much, well, not much, but we have better data here. And this, 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 where this curve comes in to the Earth and Venus line is about 1.6 Earth radii, so right where this green arrow is. And when you cube 1.6, you get about four Earth masses. So four Earth, four, four Earth masses and 1.6 Earth radii is where this asymptotes to a Venus and Earth like composition. TESS will do wonderful things in this region right here, between, let's say, one and, and five, to get that much more accurate about how big does a planet have to be to become rocky and then transition to being gaseous. OK. How about the eccentricity? This is something, oh, for the past 20 years, the eccentricity distribution of these exoplanets has been, oh, just, uh, just highly eccentric, not kind of circular like ours. Well, it's a very new paper. And the answer to is, is the eccentricity of our solar system unusually low? And the answer is no. Here's a new paper that's not even out yet, but uh, he presented this result about a month ago in the astrobiology conference, and I was, I was pretty impressed by it. And the answer is that no, our, the eccentricity, the low eccentricities of our solar system are not atypical, and that the previously thought eccentricity distributions was due to a selection effect associated with the type of planets we are seeing, namely hot Jupiters, which only make up 5, 10, most 12 percent uh, of the population that we're seeing. Okay, how about the abundances? The abundances in the sun, this was shown before, but it was also said, and I repeat, this is also the abundances in the universe. So the sun is not a bad proxy for the distribution of elements in the universe. It's not just our solar system, but the universe. And here's hydrogen and helium, and you can see this is a log plot, so these are much more abundant. And here are the metals, everything here. And they're the, I guess they're called major elements in Earth science talk. Now, here's a molecular cloud. Here's a new region of, there's about a thousand stars that have just formed out of this molecular cloud, and they are formed out of this material. So it's just kind of like a baby being formed. The baby is made out of the stuff from which it comes through this placenta. And now, how variable is the metallicity, are, how variable are the elemental abundances of these other stars in the universe? Well, 
here's, this is the fraction of solar abundance. The sun is here in this gray line here. So here are about 62 stars, and you can see some have high metallicity. They go jit, 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 jit. Some have low metallicity, about one-tenth of solar here. But you can see that they have oh, similar shapes, but they go up and down by 10, 20, 30, 40 percent. And sometimes they go down in similar ways, but some, not, not all the time from here to here, for example. So that's the type of variation we expect that we can measure in stars in the galaxy and therefore in the universe. We have no reason to ex expect that our galaxy is different from other galaxies. So this represents the type of variability that we have in host stars. That variability will be reflected in the composition of the rocky planets, which are forming out of the same stuff, but, the, but are just devolatilized versions of what you're seeing here. Caveat, when you see, oh, what about carbon-rich stars, it's very important that we're talking about proxies that are representative of the bulk of the star, not just dredge up from to the surface where it becomes visible. So carbon stars, for example, are not carbon rich, except in the photosphere when you measure them. So they would not be candidates for saying, oh, the planets around that star would then be rich in carbon. You have to be careful of things like that. OK, so here are a bunch of elements. And here is the solar composition by number. So 91% of the atoms in the sun are hydrogen, 8.8 .8 are helium. And then we have about this much oxygen and this much carbon. Now, to first order, if you're going to make an Earth, what you do with the carbon and oxygen is you take all of the carbon, or almost all the carbon that isn't in graphite, and then you combine it with the oxygen, and then, poof, it goes away in the inner part of the, the system. And then you're left with a bunch of oxygen in our case. That oxygen then just combines with this and this and this and this and everything that it can combine with, and that's how you make an Earth. If it were the other way around, if the C to O ratio were greater than 1, then this would be high, this would be low. Almost all of the, car all of the oxygen would have been used up in the CO. We would have had lots of carbon, which would then combine with this and this and this, and we'd have a carbide planet. Most of the stars in the universe, in the galaxy, have O bigger than C, but there will be some uh, at the tail of the distribution, which that's not the case. And that's why there's a, some nice papers talk about carbon planets based on a CO ratio that's relatively high compared to the norm. OK, so this we saw yesterday in Mark Hirschman's talk. And essentially, we're seeing the depletion of N, volatile species, and C, in when you're close to the Earth, close to the sun, and then you're getting more and more of that volatile as you get further away until you reach about the sun here, and the same thing for carbon. So what we did is uh, we made a version of this. Now, Hai Young is a graduate student. Hai Young, can you raise your hand here? <laughs> this, is my, this is my graduate student. He's the one who made this plot. And what it is is condensation temperature here, so really volatile things here and less volatile things here. Here's the sun at one in yellow, and then Here's the Earth, same, 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 and then like this. So we have a devolatilization pattern, which are, we are trying to make precise enough to be useful as a tool, which we would like to apply to other stars, because we know the abundances of other stars from spectroscopy, but we want to guess that using this devolatilization pattern, predicting that it's semi, or at least semi-universal, to say, oh, rocky planets will also be a devolatilization, not of our star, but of their star, which we can measure. And then we look at CI chondrites, it's the same, and then it goes down. Comets go, and then go down. And I think Jupiter is somewhere here, too. So the whole point is that things get more devolatilized when they get closer to a hot source, which I think is a, a universal feature of, every, of the, it's even, even beyond the observable universe, that statement is true. OK, what about the sun? You might hear. Is we wrote a paper, a comprehensive comparison of the sun to other stars, searching for self-selection effects. The idea being, well, here we are. We're, we're kind of special. Or are we special? We're, we're, uh, we're alive. Is our sun partic is it particularly interesting or different from other suns? Well, when you put the sun, here's the sun right here, and compare it to the metallicity of other stars, it's kind of within one sigma in the metallicity. So it's not particularly metal rich or metal poor. It's within one sigma here. The thing that stands out the most about the sun is its mass. Here's the distribution of the nearest 200 and 250 stars. And you can see that the sun right here at one solar mass is quite high. Only 5% are here, 95% are here. So we're kind of a two sigma massive uh, star. 
that we're orbiting. That might have to do with more massive stars produce more UV, and you need UV to get life started, but that's not something that I can, I'm very informed about. Now here's all, the, all the, the things we looked at. The sun is typical. So here we have the, the, the middle of the, the median of the distributions of all the stars we could get a hold of. And in terms of stellar mass, it's off here at two sigma. In terms of host, the mass of the host galaxy, it's about one sigma. Galax galactic radius, how far it is from the center. Here, iron content, oh, it's a little bit metal rich. Stellar age, oh, it's a little bit younger. Host group mass, it's a little bit younger, a little bit smaller, rather height above the galactic plane, et cetera. So you can, you can compare the sun to other stars in any parameter space you'd like to to see if it stands out, to see if there's anything that might be associated with habitability that would be responsible for us being here, possibly. For example, you can think, if, our, if life were based on uranium and the sun was the most uranium-rich star in the galaxy, we'd say, whoo! We would go then and look for the most uranium-rich stars elsewhere and say, that's probably where there's life. There would be a correlation there. And, uh, but that's not what we find. We don't find anything that stands out like that. There doesn't seem to be any selection effect for the sun as uh, far as any of the things we've looked at. Now, CO is very important. And here's the sun. It's within about one sigma. It's a little low compared to the med median. And why is that important? That's important because C and O are the two most important abundant elements after hydrogen and helium. These are the things that determine the chemistry of the disk that's going to form this, the planet. And so, how is that, why is that so important? Look at this, here's CO. As soon as CO gets above one, boom, you turn into a graphite titanium carbide, silicon carbide, you turn into an iron and carbide planet. Over here are all the rocky planets. When you say the word rocky, this is what you mean. CO less than this, so that this is the condensation sequence that you get. Now, up here we have distributions. Here's at eight kiloparsecs. The sun is that distance from the center of the galaxy. Here's two kiloparsecs. The CO ratio goes up as you get closer and closer to the center of the galaxy. That, that, what's, that's what happens when you get higher metallicity. But only the tail end goes over here. So that's why I said maybe the number of carbide planets will be 5% oh, or so, and 95% of the small rocky planets are silicate rocky rather than carbide rocky. Okay, now you can go further than that because you have all these elements from the stars and you can say, okay, what's the C to O ratio of this host star and what's the MG on SI ratio? And we can start to play many, many games in a much higher parameter space to, to make guesses after you devolatilize these elements to make guesses about the mineralogy of the, uh, of the planets, the terrestrial planets, which we have a hard time seeing and that will be true for the next 10 years or so. So there's this book, Rare Earth. And... Uh, I read it and I thought, this shouldn't be called rare earth, it should be called rare animal because it had to deal with all of the details in our history that led to the emergence of animals. For example, the KT, the impact, the Chicxulub, all right? Well, that was a, that's kind of rare, but it's a very particular kind of thing that you know, wiped out the dinosaurs and allowed mammalian radiation. But that's not the type of thing that I think we should be talking about when we talk about the, the I guess, the important features that lead to the origin of life. Now, this book does talk about the important features that lead to the origin of life. And are we talking about rare geochemistry? Well, I didn't read the whole book yet. I haven't read the whole book yet. But as far as I can tell, there's no unobtainium, unobtainium in this book. So I was hard pressed to find something that is unique to terrestrial geochemistry. So if you want to claim somehow that life is so wonderfully unique here on Earth, and at the same time, you believe strongly that life emerged from geochemistry in the continuous way that Eric Smith so eloquently described yesterday, then you have to find something about the geochemistry of Earth that would be different from the geochemistry of these other billions and billions of billions of Earth-like planets. Now, here's a, just trying to make contact with geochemistry, biogeochemistry. Here's this book, this uh, paper that we show, somebody else showed yesterday. Uh, and uh, here is this you know, nice little, hey, these are like, like core metabolisms. But what I'm trying to talk about is this production of H2, CO2, H2S, the geochemistry from which these things seem to emerge spontaneously. We have no reason to believe that uh, rock, rocky planets would not produce the same type of highly diverse geochemical environments that we see um, on Earth. And uh, also, by the way, don't forget that the building blocks of life in these carbonaceous chondrites, the amino acids are falling from the sky, and that's not just the amino acids, but 
that type of bombardment, particularly the early bombardment, that we expect, that we think we happen on Earth, is something that's fully extrapolatable to the formation of rocky planets anywhere in the universe. So I changed that to skies. All right, here's a picture of the whole history of the universe. And here's the Big Bang, hydrogen and helium are produced, and stars are produced. This is all physics, this is all deterministic science. And then this conference is talking about the origin of life, and then here's where you get this, these living forms here that uh, you can get from phylogenetic trees. Um, but the, another way to say that is uh, four and a half billion years ago, this is what the sun looked like, and today it, it turned into that. Now the question is, we're not trying to find, this is kind of a quirky thing, and we shouldn't expect that elsewhere. Uh, but that's what happened on our planet. But I think in the origin of life community, we're not interested in this. We're interested in those, those previous core metabolisms. Uh, one other thing is the faint early sun paradox is a faint early host star problem. It's not just a sun problem. It's the problem of any star. Why? Because when you, stars start on the zero age main sequence, and you can see in this regime what happens to them. They go up, 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 up. So they start faint. This is luminosity over here. They start faint and then increase. So faint faint early host star problem is something that's universal. It has to do with zero evolving off the main sequence. That's every star does. Uh, then there's this orbit matters problem. So here's the ha habitable zone here. And, uh, I, and we wrote a paper called The Case for a Gaian Bottleneck, the Biology for Habitability. And in it, essentially, when you see these habitable zone plots, it says, oh, from here to here is kind of habitable. What does that mean? In your head, you're doing this. We have, here's the habitable zone. Here's our planet. It's in the habitable zone. And then we have some type of supporting, I don't know, negative feedback that maintains this planet up here in high habitability. If you go over here, you get runaway glaciation. You're too cold, too far away. Here is runaway greenhouse, too hot. And because of the Walker paper, 1981, we, have, we invoke silicate weathering negative feedback. The strength of that negative feedback is what produces these ridges here and produces the width of that habitable zone. Now, it's also something like everybody's body hidden here is like 37 degrees plus or minus 0.5 or so, and that thermal regulation is something that has evolved, and it's the same type of thing. Here's 37, you get too high, oh, you got to pull it back, get too low, pull it back. But then if it gets really, really too hot, poop, you turn into meat, here you turn into meat as well, so you die. Now, it might be the case that in the first billion years, I could not find any justification for negative feedback from silicate weathering. If that's the case, then instead of this picture, you have this picture, where there is no stability there at all. You have boop, runaway greenhouse, runaway glaciation, too hot, too cold, there is no negative feedback, and you have no width of, at all of the habitable zone. So instead of saying that not only is the habitable zone strongly atmosphere dependent, it may very well be Biology dependent, because biology is something that does create these types of wells, as your body is doing right now in this room. Okay, cars don't stay on the road without a driver. Planets don't remain habitable without life. So here are these no lovely trees. And I guess I wanted to say is, if you go back in time, as you go back further and further towards these roots of the tree of life, you are talking about things that are becoming more and more closely related to geochemistry. And that geochemistry, as far as I can tell, is not different from the geochemistry of rocky planets that seem to be everywhere in the universe. So conclusions, lots of Earth, but not a lot of Japans or kangaroos. Two, the parameter space of geochemistry that led to life on Earth, to the extent to which we understand it, does not look like a sparsely populated region of exogeochemistry. Three, are we, as we understand more about LUCA and the origin of life on Earth, our biology is linking up to geochemistry and is becoming more extrapolatable to the origin of life elsewhere. One way to say that is early biogeochemistry is more universal than current biogeochemistry, i.e. kangaroos. We should expect life elsewhere, but it is probably dead, according to the Gaian bottleneck hypothesis. And here's the chicken and egg problem. This is, a, this is the oxygen problem. For, this is a blow up of a chicken egg, and you can see it can let oxygen in and out. So that's the, the egg problem. Here's the chicken problem, trying to get that egg through the pelvis. And, uh, <laughs> Chicken and egg problem. Now, what's one more comment that, that uh, Eric Smith talked about rampant inappropriate dichotomies. That's probably a mis misquote, but anyway, I feel too that we're, we, have, we, we suffer from rampant 
inappropriate dichotomies. And I guess the reason for that is this brain we have, you can see it's bilaterally symmetric. So we got dichotomy right here with the organ that we're using to find it. And I also, you can see that here's why we can't smell it all, because the tiny, tiny olfactory lobes that we have compared to most everything else. And thank you very much. And I thank the Big Bang for making this research puzzle. All right, so time for questions. Nobody stirred up yet? <laughs> buy the book, right, Eric? Buy the book. It's a good book. It's a good book. <laughs> yes. Charlie, I'm glad you're still having fun. <laughs> uh, all right. The, Aren't the, you, Joe? Aren't you? Yes, I am, actually. <laughs> Uh, the real question is, okay, for origin of life, that's fun. That means slime or something. Um, you think that the, the rest of the life is dead? Then why aren't we? Right. So the question, therefore, so in this, in this paper, we have said, you know what? Without, uh, without this negative feedback, the Earth and every other rocky planet, this is what we'd expect. Now, it, the reason it's called the guy in bottleneck is because we're saying, well, how did we get out of that? And the an we think the answer is that occasionally there is a planet that has life that figures out how to control the albedo or how to control the greenhouse gases. And when it does that successfully, it's kind of like a random variation, when it does that successfully, bump, out comes life and it starts to build these things and then we have a habitable zone. So habitability it's kind of like, uh, you, just like any life form does anything. How do you get an eyeball? You have a whole bunch of people, most of whom can't see. The one that survives is the one that can see. You get a whole bunch of planets that are like this. Randomly, you have some biology that figures it, not doesn't figure it out, but it happens to uh, control the greenhouse in a way that, that makes this little flat. And then Darwinian selection. That's how I would say it. It's not something that. Yeah. That, for the first billion years or so, or maybe the first half a billion, then boom, it goes glaciation, goes kind of like everything becomes a Venus or everything becomes a Mars. That's right, that's right, that's right. But the fossils will be there. <laughs> so uh, I want to ask a kind of a Larry Henderson question, Charlie. Um, not as he would ask it, but so Henderson starts out by saying that blood pH would have to be a lot more heavily actively regulated than it is, except that it happens to occupy a region where you have a carbonate buffer or a bicarbonate buffer. So in some sense, the fact that blood is where it is should have enabled us to look in the phase space of dissolved gases and fluids for the places where buffering was easy because that would be a kind of a path of least resistance. If I think about this question of runaways and whether the hill really is an inverted parabola that way, is there a kind of an anthropic argument that where you see a biosphere, there may have been stabilizing effects on the planet even if your current modeling sophistication doesn't make you aware of where they are? Sure, sure. In other words, you're saying, hey, Charlie, this parabola, they probably have different shapes. I said, yeah, sure. But, there's, but the, my whole point is that people have just swallowed this canonical model of, hey, there's a habitable zone when you're at the right distance. And not only is it the atmosphere, but I think the, the inhabitants may play a very important role in how wide that is and where it is. Yeah, certainly. But lots of variability. I mean, I'm, I'm not claiming that I can know where this is. I'm just saying, hey, there's some type of instability this way, some type of instability this way. The canonical view has been, oh, there's a region of stability here. I said, well, is that true? Do we need to have that? Do we have that? And maybe not. And that stability is usually based on this, which we are pretty sure is not very strong in the first billion years. That's the argument. Uh, there, I mean, Adi Chopra, the lead author of this paper, will be talking about this, I guess, on Tuesday or something in a separate session. More comments, questions? We've got plenty of time. Yes. Um. Yeah, just uh, why do you think because life appear 
rapidly on Earth, then sh there should be life everywhere. It just means that the con when the conditions are there, then life appears rapidly. I, I guess I've been semi-convinced by Eric's argument to some extent that saying the origin of life is a, I don't know what, what a, a cascade of phase transitions which are very closely related to the sources of energy and, uh, well, for example, the, the redox potentials that you have. And I don't, in reading this book cl as closely as I have, I don't see any reason to think that the structure, the, the mechanism that he has described have anything to do necessarily with Earth, the uniqueness of Earth. That's why I said there's no unobtainium in that book. So, uh, if that's the case, and the origin of life is connected to geochemistry, then we, I think the, the geochemical parameter space, although it could be very wide, there's no reason why that, should be, that, that space should be sparsely populated where the Earth is. If the Earth had unobtainium, and that was important for Earth, then we would, I wouldn't be able to say that. But all the elements, all of the redox potential, all of the, hey, central heat, cool, illumination here, Phototrophs, uh, autotrophs, that, I don't see any reason why that shouldn't be perfectly extrapolatable to these other billions and billions and billions of other Earths. That's the reasoning. Uh, yes, we have a question on the far side of the room. Charlie, that was a really entertaining talk. I couldn't tweet fast enough. <laughs> I was having fun. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark mentioned that uh, plate Mark, tectonics... Mark Hirschman? Mark, Mark Jelinek, Jelinek yeah. mentioned that plate tectonics enhances habitability. And in your presentation, you mentioned that life enhances habitability. So does life enhance plate tectonics? Well, I think Rosing has written a paper on that, and I kind of am a Rosing kind of guy, but I'm unqualified to comment on that beyond the literature that you can find elsewhere. <laughs> Why not? You know, I think one another paper by Harding and, and Margulis, you know, Lynn Margulis, they mentioned uh, how what is life, what has life's role been in maintaining water at the surface of the planet? Something that's usually not invoked. It's a kind of a guy in paper. It's not the greatest paper, but it is one of the fewest, pa the the only paper I've seen trying to connect the role of life in maintaining liquid on the surface of the Earth. If they're correct, then. If that's a really important thing because we don't have to look for chemical disequilibrium to see life. All we'd look for is life, uh, water on the surface. And say, oh, life did it. I'm not sure how strong that connection is, but it's certainly one that's plausible, and uh, I think it should be looked at. I'm curious. It's convenient that this slide is up. I'm curious as to why you say that there's no silicate weathering in the first billion years. I'm thinking about uh, a set of observations that perhaps are underappreciated about the inclusions in the Jack Hill zircons, where the, the most common minerals in the Jack Hill zircons included in them are quartz, muscovite, and albite feldspar. And that's an assemblage that is something, you have to take a couple steps backward, but that's an assemblage that is a characteristic of so-called S-type granites, which are partial melts of aluminous rich sediments, which are themselves the product of silicate weathering. So I think within the Jack Hill zircons, we have evidence, and this goes all the way back to the, most, the, the, the oldest of the Jack Hill zircons, uh, we have evidence that, in fact, there was silicate weathering early on this planet. Right. Uh, I guess the question should be really, instead of yes or no, it's how much. And I think the literature says that continental, when you look at the 20 plots of the increase of continental crust, you will see most of them going very low as you get to 3.5, 3.7 billion years ago. I'm sure you're right that there's some type of silicate weathering going on. The question is, the, this, the strength of the negative feedback is proportional to, I guess, the strength of the silicate weathering, and that has to go down as you're getting much, much less sub-aerial erosion of those continental crusts. That's how I would argue it. I'm, I, I shouldn't say no, I should say very little. It turns down the strength of the negative feedback, and when you do that, this habitable zone width gets smaller, and probably these, these hills get smaller, too. Um, yeah. 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 I'd like to give you several comments for this figure. Uh, you say no silicate weathering, but you, know, just you must consider the amount of ocean. So if no continent available, and then no way for silicate weathering. No sub-aerial silicate weathering. Yeah, been, right, right. There, is, there are some people who have looked at 
uh, subaqueous silicate weathering. Again, there are two problems there. How strong, the order is is smaller. How strong is it? And plus, remember, it has to be coupled. Mm. It has to be negative feedback. You can have weathering, but if it's not negatively fed back, you do not get this type of stabilization. Yeah, but first of all, for example, that it is difficult to have a, a okay, ocean planet. It's difficult to have an ocean planet? Well, yeah. um, maybe. Because if you give a okay, huge amount of carbon dioxide alert, you must transport uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide into the mantle. And also, uh, but anyway, so that therefore the size of land mass is another important key. So you can extend the idea, and just I'm going to give a, a several comments. Yeah. So then also the fate of uh, uh, H2O ocean through time, because there are uh, pre-tectonics can deliver surface ocean into the mantle. Even for the Earth, uh, the mantle transition zone can occupy more than uh, five times the total ocean on the surface. So it depends on the time. Yeah. So that, and therefore, I, I'm just going to give a kind of advice to extend your idea, how long habitable zone continue. Yeah. Oh. Well, the so, idea right, is you. that there is no original habitable zone. The width of the habitable zone in this plot should go to zero here, is one way to look at what I just said, if this hypothesis is correct. Well, since we actually um, are ahead of schedule, and Mark, who was our previous speaker, has a question, uh, go ahead and get the microphone. Oh, here we go. That's more common about uh, seafloor weathering. So the issue is whether uh, weathering or flow through hydrothermal systems produces a net flux of alkalinity cations. Uh, <clears throat> the current ocean. It's not that. The question is whether that is, is when you increase the temperature, it increases, right? It's not only what the process, it has to be coupled. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, Coogan has shown that there is a temperature coupling through the Mesozoic, certainly. Um, and about, at least in the modern ocean, about 40% of the current CO2, long-term long CO2 budget is controlled by low temperature, by weathering and low temperature hydrothermal systems. But it has to be coupled. It does, does, when you heat up the, the surface by two degrees, does that change the, surface, the bottom of the ocean temperature by two degrees? Uh, yeah, so if you look at the difference, if you look at the proxies for the Pacific and Atlantic Basin bottom water temperatures now and through the, and into the Mesozoic. So the Mesozoic was six or eight degrees warmer than now for 100 million years. The bottom water temperature was about between two and six degrees warmer than now. And the weathering efficiency was much, much higher. Um, and so... And by weathering efficiency, you mean carbonate deposits? The, yes, the production of carbonate, but also the net flux of alkalinity back into the ocean. Because uh, you can, unless you produce a flux of alkalinity back into the ocean, it doesn't matter. Um, so there's a temperature component and also the strength of the, of the flux of water through the mid-ocean ridges um, is uh, higher at mid to slow spreading rates, which are more likely early on. Right. So, so what we'd really like to evaluate this is a plot of silicate weathering, subaerial or subaqueous or wherever, as a function of four and a half billion years, and then that would be and make sure that we have, then we have a coupling constant that multiplies that, and then we could address this issue. I, I can show you one after your talk if you want. Okay, <laughs> well you have one, that's good. Now the, the co-author of this paper, Adi, back there, would, uh, has a comment. Did I say something wrong, Adi? Um, yeah. Can you wait for the microphone? Thank you. So I had a chat to Lawrence Coogan about um, this exactly. And um, he wouldn't be comfortable invoking the process that, was, that he's identified in the Mesozoic going back three billion years ago, or even four billion years ago. And part of the challenge is that communication between the surface temperature of the oceans down to bottom water temperature is not a strong, well understood one. And uh, the other point he made was even if there is active, there's some communication going on, it's the total amount of weathering he thinks is not going to be sufficient to provide a big enough negative feedback. The other thing to consider is, you know, back then because of impacts and greater volcanism, you could have the earth going back and forth between, you know, greenhouse uh, dominated or glaciation dominated events in the Hadean or pre Hadean as well. Okay, we'll do one more question and then we'll start the flash talks. So, um, 
We need a, oh, can, can you come over here, please? Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to ask for the temperature at the bottom of the ocean, do you take into consideration the thermohaline circulation or something that happens at that era? So the buoyancy driven part of the ocean circulation? Right, that, that's, the issue, I think. that's the issue that Adi was okay. just talking about and he's much more informed about it than I do, so I recommend you go talk to Adi about that issue. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, with that we will start our flash talks for this session. Now let's thank the speaker again.